Hi, and welcome to this week's Mortgage Broker Broadcast. My guest this week is Curtis Lenay from Velox Mortgages. And Curtis on the podcast is the business owner of Velox. And I wanted to get him onto the podcast talking about his journey in financial services, his journey in mortgage services so far, how he got into it, employed to self-employed, business owner, brand owner, and the rest of it. So I wanted to get him to have his to share his take and, and explain his journey, which is quite a short-lived journey so far but then also as well looking at his content and look at how he creates content and look at how he gets engaging content on instagram which is what he focuses on and why he does that and then also as well looking at his long-term business plan and looking at his long-term goals and aspirations so yeah let's just get curtis onto the podcast you're listening to the mortgage broker broadcast with me craig skelton the podcast which helps mortgage brokers at all stages of their mortgage broking career so welcome on to the podcast, Curtis. How are you? I'm good, mate. I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Very good. Thanks for agreeing to come on to the podcast and share your journey and your expertise so far and uh, take you a little bit out of your comfort zone. But I'm looking forward to having a chat with the Bolton, Br- Bolton Bay. I can't even get my words out. This is how bad it is. Bolton Bay mortgage broker. That's like a bit of a tongue twister to be fair. It is. That's might be why it's not sticking so well. No one can say. <laughs> is, that why you, is that why you use advised on your LinkedIn rather than Bolton? Bol- I can get it now. I cannot actually say those words. How bad is that? So uh, yeah, I'll just stick to uh, Curtis from now on. Then I think we'll just leave it there. Yeah. A bit easier that one. <laughs> yeah, certainly is. Certainly. So you good? Everything all right in the the world of mortgage broking for you? Yeah, it's going well. It's going well. It's been a uh, very different. As you know, from what I have been doing previously, going from employed to self-employed, it's been a bigger change than I thought it would be. Like, I knew it would be a massive sort of shock to the system, but there's just so much that you you don't know what you don't know, really, do you? So when you do start doing it, it's like you just drown it. You've got no armband. <laughs> Someone help me. <laughs> That's, you're absolutely right. The thing is, you don't know what you don't know. And I think that was... That's why I really do appreciate you coming onto the podcast. And I want to obviously talk about you and your, your journey, but also the brand, the sort of the story behind the brand as well, which I'm sure will, which will come out. And just, yeah, just really, I know you will give an honest opinion. And that's the good thing for the mortgage brokers out there who listen to podcasts and maybe are self employed already or the ones that aren't self employed, employed thinking, and, and they will get inspiration from your sort of journey of going from what you've achieved so far and, and also the future as well so do you want to so let's just start from that i've obviously explained that you're based in bolton so that gives that away that the little bit but are you bolton born and bred are you what you sort of lived there all your life yeah so I've always lived in bolton my whole life i've only been in uh three addresses always west Bolton in bolton for anyone who knows it so right. born and bred big bolton fan as you know um and then I don't really see myself moving anywhere too different, to be honest, unless something yeah. crazy happens and end up in Australia. But yeah, I don't think you're gonna get a season ticket to Bolton Wanderers if you're uh, at the uh, <laughs> if you're based out there. To be fair, yeah, I'm not saying so, up to him to watch us get a point away at Burton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the exciting game of the weekend. A point away at Burton Albion. Burton Albion, yeah, yeah it's Burton Albion. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it my. <laughs> So we want to talk about football. Let's talk about you and your, your work. So first of all, always like your first, when did you sort of get into to financial services? How long ago was that? Um, so the story is I went to college, went to uni after that. I was doing an accounting and finance degree at uni. And it wasn't for me. I, I, I just found it as boring as people said, like the accounting side of it. Like I kind of thought it'd be an urban myth and you'd go there and it wouldn't be that bad. But for me, I suppose everyone's different. For me, I got there and I just thought, it's not not for me, this. Um, so I dropped out of uni and I got a job in debt management. So straight away into like financial services, but on that side of things. Um, and then while I was doing that, I paid for my CMAP. Because I knew that like mobilizing was something I wanted to get into. So while I was working that job, I paid for my CMAP, did my qualifications, and then got a job employed at Fluent, initially uh, as an equity release advisor, is where it started. Right. Wow. So, so quite an interesting journey to get. So what, what was it when you sort of saying there that you knew you wanted to get into to mortgage advising? It wasn't then just a way of getting out of college and being working on the accountant 
kind of thing of being a course in college, which I'm sure that was um, filled your days with joy and um, fulfillment, shall we say. But in terms of, so what what was it about? Was it always something to get into mortgages or was it just something you, you realised at a certain time or? Um, I don't know. I think if I'm going to be completely honest, where it started was I was sort of Googling like some of the higher paid jobs. <laughs> uh -huh. like, which ones would I like, which ones wouldn't I? Like, I remember seeing Mortgage Advisor come up and it wasn't something that I'd thought of myself um, before. And then the more I thought about it, the more it kind of seemed like it's a people facing job. You're speaking to people, is that the main bulk of your job? Obviously, at the time, I didn't realize there was that much admin behind it. So I was maybe seeing, seeing a bit too much into it there. But um, yeah, it was just like the speaking to people side of it. And I knew that you could eventually start your own business in doing that. So that was part of the thinking behind going into it as well. Because in my employment, there was no way out. There was no way of ever setting up on my own. So I wanted something that I could go into, which then had scope to set up on my own in the future, which led me down the road of mortgage advice. It's not a bad way to start in terms of just searching on Google and looking for the <laughs> more, more paid jobs in the UK or wherever you where you put the location down. So not a bad place to start. But like I said they don't. They'll tell you the the best paid one, obviously, but they don't give you all the the joys of being a mortgage broker in the background and, and the, the dramas that and the lifestyle that that creates. This is it. This is it. You only see one side, don't you? Yeah. And that's the thing with all these things, when you start Googling best paid jobs, you'll only ever see the the the, the glamorous side of it because that's what you're, you're interested in. You don't want to know the 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 challenging parts, shall we say. So, so first of all, so debt management, then into – so then you first – employed role was equity release which is well what a way to start in terms of um mortgage <laughs> services was that did you know about equity release when you when what when was that how when was july 21 from your yeah or two yeah. years ago july 21 it was yeah so um if, i just kind of felt that it matched more with what i was doing sort of on the debt side of things because i was on the vulnerable customer team when i was doing the debt side of things right. and then the equity release, the regulation around it, and there was a lot more vulnerability in equity release. So I felt that sort of matched up more with the type of people that I'd been dealing with before and I had more skills that I could bring along to start an equity release. So that was the thinking behind that. Okay, which does make sense because I say normally all the, the equity release advisors I know generally start in mortgage broking, mortgage services first, and then go into equity uh, release as an either specialist topic or add it as part of their um proposition so it's interesting one to go straight into that when but like again like you said it makes perfect sense when you get when your background was before that in sort of debt management and vulnerability so it certainly did so what what was your take you were employed as equity release advisor at the time what was your sort of take on the equity release market when you sort of got in there fairly quickly yeah, so when I got in there, I got in before all the uh, the chaos of rates going up and the mini budget. So when I first started, you could get an interest rate fixed for life at 2.5%, I want to say, which wow. I think people pay a lot of money for that now. Probably sell yeah. limbs to get that these days. Um, but at the time going in, you just think that was normal. And I remember speaking to customers and they thought 2.5% was a high interest rate because you could get 1% or 2% on a mortgage. So... Going into it, I, that was the experience I had of interest rates being so low. And then I was also there when they started to rise and then you're doing fixed life interest rates at 6 or 7%. So it's quite a, a chaotic period to be in there, to be honest. Uh, no, definitely. I say it was good to, like, when you look back now, and we can all say this, can't we, in terms of just normal standard residential mortgage as well, looking at the rates that they were back in July 2021, a couple of years ago. But I think... It, what was your was it with the equity advising? Was that a basic like call center environment? Was you just dealing with people over the phone or virtual or? Yes, yeah, so it was all over the phone. So it was office based, not far from where I live. Uh, Fluent money they're called. So they're like right. a national bridge. So it's all just done over the phone. Right. And what's that like? How did you find equity release as a product selling that product? Um, yeah, good. It is a good product for the right person, but that's the key point to make. It has to be for the right person at the right time as well. So I think the main difference between a mortgage and equity release is with a mortgage, 99.9% .9 of the time it's the right thing. You're not really having to discuss whether getting
getting a mortgage is the right thing or not. Whereas with equity release, the main bulk of your discussions are centered around, is this actually the right thing for you to do? And then once you've nailed down that it's the right thing to do, then you have to go into all that, the product details. And, and then again, it's always at the front of your mind whether it's still the right thing to do. So it's like, a, um, there's a lot more you have to think about with equity release and that there's more angles that it can be looked at from rather than mortgages where you want a mortgage, this is the best mortgage that's available compared to equity release, you want equity release, but have you thought about doing this instead or all these other avenues that you can go down? And did you always find like going through that in that kind of, because like, you're absolutely right in terms of most people that were, and you can correct me on this because obviously you, like, I, I was selling it quite a number of years ago. You were selling it more recently than I was. With equity release, you tend to find that the customers were eligible for it. You were just making sure that it was right for them. Whereas with mortgage clients, you're trying to get them eligible for the mortgage, whether it's right, for, obviously it's right for them anyway, because it's the home that they're, they're interested in. So just a totally different concept that you've got to get your, get, get your head around, really. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Because you can have people making inquiries to take equity release out for all kinds of reasons. And you're speaking to them and you're thinking, is this really the right reason to do it? I remember I had one customer where <laughs> this old guy and he hated his son. He absolutely hated his son. And he wanted to do an equity release to take all the money out of the house, make no payments to it, just to make sure that his son had no inheritance. And it's like, you would never get that on a mortgage, would you? So it's just completely no. different. No. <laughs> But it's quite surprising how many people, because when I did equity release for a short period of time, you, was it about just over 12 months, 15 months you did it for, by, from from what you said? It was a short period of time that I did it for, but I found even in that short period of time, they experienced, there was clients out there that was exactly the same. They just they were doing it to cut out their family in terms of it, the inheritance. They were just literally, they, they wanted to leave nothing whatsoever to those people. And obviously there's different ways of doing that and not being charged interest on your property, but that was their motivation. Yeah. Well, I think that's the thing with equity release as well. You really do see sort of the best and worst out of families and that you'll see, like I just said, that guy who's trying to take all the money out because he wants to leave nothing to his son. But then you'll also see the couple who've worked their whole life, they want to take their money out of the house to go and buy a caravan that they've always dreamt of. And then they've got kids that say, no, you can't do it because I want my inheritance. So it's, you see both sides of the coin where people can just be so selfish on both sides from the people who are leaving the inheritance and the people who are taking it. But you just sat there thinking, is this real life? <laughs> but that, there are people like you've experienced it, I've experienced it. You get those people that think, well, you are ruining my inheritance and I'm not allowing you to buy a caravan even though you've worked hard all your life and that's yeah. you've raised your money and your right to do whatever you want to do with it. But then we also sort of see that, and I'm sure you've experienced it as well, where the family are involved and really pushing the fact, pushing the parents to do it because they want to see their parents have that quality of life at yeah. the later time in their life, really. And that's the thing with equity release as well, because the family members should be part of the discussion. So you'd always mention, if you spoke to your family about this, what do they think about it? You can speak to their family as well if they've got any questions, as long as they're happy. So it should be a family discussion when you do an equity release, but the children shouldn't be the decision maker, in my view. If the parents want to I don't think the, the children or the family members should be stopping them if it's the right thing for them to do. So if it was my parents, I'm more than happy for them to go spend their money that they've earned and whatever they choose. So I don't expect anything from my parents, so I don't understand why anyone else would really, but that's just my view. To be fair, I think it's a... I think it's a generation thing, to be fair, Curtis. I think it is, like, my, I'm with you. I don't expect anything from my parents. I would rather see them enjoy it and spend it a later time in their life when they've earned it. And I know how hard they've worked for that, the money and the house. And I mean, I'd rather see them enjoy it. I think it's more of, I don't like, it's certainly how you've been brought, but then I think it's also a generation thing as well. Not that I'm in the same generation as you, because clearly I'm not. <laughs> Absolutely not. But I think it is just the sort of the the older generation. But I think my generation are more accepting of is well, I've worked all my life and my parents have worked all their life, so let them, en them enjoy. You've got I think you've got a mix of people that 
my generation is more split with regards to inheritance. I think the generation above me, I think they are very much, well, they feel as though they've got a right to some sort of inheritance because that's their mindset. It's different for me. And I think as the layers come down, like my 18-year-old son knows that he's getting, not, I'm literally leaving nothing. I'm literally, <laughs> he, can, he can do what he wants. Like, he's fine. He'll, he'll be absolutely fine. But he knows he's got to earn the money himself. And and, and I'm joking. Jo I'm joking about that kind of thing. But... <laughs> I think there's a lot of people that, and a few people, a lot of people that I speak to where they pay them, they know that they're paying them. But look, you look at the what's happened in the mortgage world right now, like like today, which um, HSBC now doing 40 year term for mortgages. People are going to be paying the mortgages for a lot longer in terms of their age. So you're going to be getting, people are going to be working to pay off the mortgage to sort of age 70, 75, and then doing equity release. To then just enjoy those the time that they've got left, and I think that's what will happen with the, this product. I think just, I think that's what happened with the marketplace. I don't. I think it's good that the right people are able to. Ex it's just the same thing as it's like you said about equity lease being for the right people. It's the same thing as a forty-year term with a, a lender is good for the right people. It's not the right thing for everybody, but it's just giving clients that other option. Whereas equity release. From the ones that I saw and the people that I dealt with, there wasn't really any other options. They, they, it was literally got this or sell the house or go into care or and not do the things that they wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the time you do see that where it is their only option, especially all these interest-only mortgages that are reaching the end of the term and the, the customers are 68 and 70 and they've got to find 125 grand to pay the mortgage off that they bought with an endowment policy in the 80s and it's yeah. like where they expected to find that money from so someone like that is definitely, definitely the right option for them if they can or don't want to downsize yeah. but then you do decide as well where they'll just want to go on a mad one and they'll just want to give money away or as soon as that spending a bit of money then they've got the bite and they want to have more and more and more so you have got to be careful with it still yeah definitely no definitely so enough about actually but thanks for sharing your opinion because obviously you did that for for a period of time so it was good to understand your journey and what like that part of your experience and what and what you, do you ever think that you'll get back into equity so i know you're not doing the moment but is that something you'll ever get back into as an individual or from a business point of view um maybe i'd never say never but it's not at the forefront of my mind i think it's a good product for the right person but it's just from more of what i'm trying to do myself what i'm trying to align myself with it doesn't really fit with my goals for the so it's not a problem with the products it's just more what i'm yeah. trying to yeah Fine. yeah no worries not so you did equity release advising and then you then went you you left you obviously still with fluent but then you left being equity release advisor to then be a, a mortgage an employed mortgage advisor is that right yeah that's right so i moved teams so at fluent they've got different divisions for different sort of branches like bridging loans equity release mortgages so i went over to the mortgages team and did like your more standard residential and buy to let mortgages and so that employed time for nine months or so didn't put you off being a, a mortgage broker then mortgage advisor <laughs> no, nearly it had its moments <laughs> yeah. no that's so, honesty you, you every single broker will go through those times curtis so yeah that is honesty if you said no 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 it's perfect then Every broker listening to this is thinking, no, you're not on this planet, mate. That, that's not right. <laughs> yeah. The rates getting pulled with no notice and oh, just chaos, yeah. With that was the, So even though, I think, obviously you went through that when you was employed, so that's a different... A lot of brokers that listen to this podcast are self-employed mortgage brokers, so it's difficult to understand. That it's obviously bad enough for any broker, whether you're employed or self-employed, but from an employed point of view... It was just sort of giving you chaos as well. From from it didn't matter whether you're employed or self-employed, you were still getting the chaos. Yeah, still getting the chaos. It just, I suppose, it has less of an impact on you when you're employed, because ultimately it goes down to the company, doesn't it? Rather than if you're self-employed, it's all on you. Because if I'm ill, then the company has someone else that can do the job. Because there's however many hundred people that work there. Whereas when you're self-employed, you've got all that responsibility on your shoulders, haven't you? So. You're, it's a lot more stressful, I imagine, for self-employed brokers at that time than it was for me being employed. 
I think that's like, it's a good point. Like you said, at least you can, when you're replacing cases three and four or five times over because the length, where for, for various reasons, as we've already experienced, then I think that's it's part of just your job in it. That's the, that's the thing from that point of view. But I'm still, I'm sure you still want to deliver the right oh, um, yeah. for your clients and the right service for your clients. Yeah, of course you do every time, but it's just, it's a lot easier to do that when you're at a, a big company and there's 20 people above you at managerial level. There's a hundred colleagues on your level that are advising as well, where it's just so easy to go and if you need any help with anything, you can just go and ask someone. Whereas when you're self-employed, you sort of lose that sort of that structure of being able to just go and turn to the person next to you and ask a question. Where yeah. there's still someone there, it's just not as easily accessible because you've got to pick up the phone and call someone, which you wouldn't always do. Whereas if you've got someone sat next to you, you'll just talk all day while you're asking any question that you've got. Definitely. So employed mortgage broker and then 2023 comes along and you decide that you've had enough of the employed world already you want to be self-employed was that something you always wanted have been self-employed and obviously your own brand and your own business was that always on the cards yeah so growing up i'd always wanted to sort of have my own business like i remember going through school and i used to think at the time that having your own business would be like coming up with your own invention <laughs> thinking of what am i going to invent and have my own business and then you get older and you kind of realize <laughs> I'm not going to invent anything. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> nowhere near clever enough to be inventing anything. <laughs> you never know. You never know. <laughs> well, maybe, mate. maybe. Um, but like, even in school, I did business in school, thinking that might give me a tip. And then at college, I did business at college, thinking surely I'll have a business idea at the end of this. And then there's nothing. And then going into mortgages, I always knew that the end of the mortgages would be going self-employed and setting up on my own. So that was always the end goal. It just came about a bit quicker than I thought it might have done. Right. I know, but like you say, I think most mortgage brokers have the aspiration to be self-employed at some stage. You've just accelerated equity release, employed, and now self-employed and owning your own brand and business in a sort of such a short space of time, which is testament to you. I think that's sort of down to you in terms of what you're just going for what you want to go for rather than sort of is that just how you are? I think you just like you knew that this was something you want to do, and you think, right, I just need to get on with it now, or circumstances, or a bit of both. I'd say I'd, I'd like to think I'm like that, but I don't think I am as much like that as I probably think I am. In that, I think it just reached a point where I thought there's never the right time to do something. There'll always be a better time if you keep waiting for the right time. There'll always be a reason why you could just put it off and not start now. Like you could look at, oh, the economy is not great. I wait for the economy to get better. And then the economy gets better and you're doing well in work. So you think, oh, I'm doing well in work, so I'll stay here. And then there's always the next reason not to do it. So I thought I might as well just bite the bullet. If I do it now, you're taking the biggest steps. So then it's all downhill from there. And the economy is a bit all over the place. No one knows what's happening with interest rates. But the way I was seeing it at the time was it can only really get better. I'd be very surprised. I'd be very shocked if it did get worse than when I started. I, th I think it's just... Um... The thing is, like you said, people will always find that as an excuse, or oh, it's not the right time, or the economy's not right, the wind's not blowing in the right direction, or whatever. They'll, you can always find an excuse not to do something, or and you can worry about that, or you can think, do you know what, the, all the things that you've sort of said, and all the excuses that people come, come out with, they can't control. So it's like, well, you're just always going to, you've either got to just face fact and think to yourself, you ain't ever going to do it, or like you did, you just got to get on with it. Did you think a lot about it? Was it some like a big, like a long time, a long thought process, or did you think I already knew this is what I wanted, so let me just get on and make it work? Um, it's tricky on that because I always knew it was something that I wanted to do, but then actually doing it still wasn't easy. Like it wasn't easy handing my notice in at work and not knowing where the next bit of money was going to come from. Like, I remember having my notice in my hand, sat in my car before I was going to give it in. And just looking, thinking, am I doing the right thing here? <laughs> and my legs are shaking. My, what, like, what's going on? Um, but, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. It wasn't easy doing it. It wasn't easy. So, it was like I say, it was just one of them where I thought, if I keep making excuses, I'm only making excuses because I'm scared to make the decision. So, the sooner I make the decision, then the quicker it's done with. Because it's like eating... You've just got to make the decision, get it done with straight away. 
because I either do it now or I do it in a year's time. And if I do it in a year's time, I've got a year of worrying about what's going to happen in a year's time. Whereas if I do it now, I just get rid of all that worrying and it's just done and sorted yeah. then. And that I totally agree. I think the thing is, the best, what the obviously there is plenty of sayings around this, but best time to plant a tree was yesterday. But if you haven't done it yesterday, do it today. It's the same, like, say, same thing as best start, time to start a pension yesterday if you haven't done that then start it today it's, it's the same thing with anything is that if you know ultimately this is what you want and i think it's funny like you sat in that car and t- t- not that car you sat in your car thinking am i doing the right thing i think with when i look back to when i went self-employed and left and i was far more ingrained in the employed world the corporate world and um i can remember just sat there thinking and I've used this term so many times in my past and still now is thinking, what is the worst that can happen? If, and yeah. I've always thought this, I've, I've always thought this throughout my life is that what's the worst that can happen? Not, nobody's taken away my arms, my hands, my legs, my feet, my what's up here. Nobody's taken that away. So I always have that. And so what's the worst can happen? This go, I do this go self-employed, set my firm up, and it falls flat on its face, well, I'll just go back being employed. I'll go back to, and I've lost nothing apart from knowing that I gave it a go, I gave it the best shot, and it didn't work out. And that's the thing sometimes is that you'll always, I think once you've always, if, once you've got that sort of itch to be a self-employed advisor, if you never scratch that itch, you will always have it there. You it will always yeah. feel like something you've never achieved or something you've never actually done and i think like for you like you said the words you were sort of saying is that like being brave and scared everybody's going to go through that situation it would only be natural if it's only natural to do that and if it wouldn't be natural if you didn't do that so i think yeah. um yeah you just got to get on with it and do it and that's the thing so so that was start of 2023 and then that so that's when well, I'll let I'll let you say the name of your firm and the reason behind why you call it. Because it is a quite a cool story, so I do like that. <laughs> it's not the best story ever, but so the firm's Velox Mortgages. So Velox is basically Latin for fast. There's not a, a great story behind it, but I was just trying to come up with like a, a brand name which no one else really has because I didn't want just to be Curtis Linney Mortgages because I'm trying to think with like a long-term view of hopefully hiring other people and would someone else want to work for Curtis Linney Mortgages? So I thought, I don't want to do that. So I want to come up with like a brand name that has room and potential to grow with. But there's so many mortgage advisors, past and present in the UK, where any name that I could think of had been taken. So I was just translating words into different languages. I was trying to do it with French at first, because I used to be able to speak a bit of French. So I'm trying to like think of words in French that I can use, and I can't think of any good ones. So I just go on Google Translate, and I'm just translating words into random languages. So I just typed in fast and then it came up Latin, uh, Velox. So I thought, go on, we'll just take that one then. I've not heard that before. It's, it's no. an easy to pronounce in English. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, no, I think that's what a great way to come up with a, a business. Like I say, some people will sort of think, spend a lot of time sort of going through names and various things. And then you sort of spend more time thinking about names and, than you actually do about advising and generating like running yeah. a business. So it's but that means sort of got it it does mean at least it means something. And like I say it's very unique, absolutely unique. And it is still a story behind that. So don't sort of like you think it's not exciting, but I think it's a good story behind that of how you sort of came around with with that name. So Velox Mortgages was born and then so then what was the plan? What was sort of because obviously we can now see, which we'll come on to, you're prolific on Instagram, see you every day, you get lots of connections, you get lots of views. And was so was that really the the, the one thing that you knew you want to do is just really sort of niche in Instagram and just go for that or um yeah, I kinda knew that social media would be what I was aiming for. So I don't really like focus specifically on Instagram too much because each video that I make goes up on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and YouTube Shorts. So it's just on Instagram where I think they tend to do a bit better than the others, I'd say. But social media was always something that I knew I'd try and aim for because I'm trying to aim for first-time buyers. 
you know, try and go where your ideal client goes. And because I am the age of my ideal client, I know that I spend a lot of my time on social media. So if I can be creating content rather than consuming it, that'll be a lot better for me. So that was like the mindset behind it. No, definitely. No, that makes what total sense. Like you say, your ideal client is on that platform and you are you creating content on that platform and you're in that the age your like your age graphic sort of the, your generation that's you're in that you're your perfect client as well aren't you kind of thing so well why not just get all that together and create content like you are doing yeah that's it because nowadays if i can try and come across as slightly relatable i'm not very camera confident yet i've only just started doing it uh, how many probably... you start doing them if i look at I mean, you've got millions of posts. how many how many posts have you got on your instagram now 67 posts 67 is it yeah, yeah. but even still, i remember putting the first one up it was it was only a couple of months ago that i did my first one so it's not been too long and i remember the fear that i had behind putting that first one up and i still get a little bit nervous now sometimes putting a video up so it's it's not easily done every time i'm fighting like a little battle to try and get a video up and get it out there but the battles are getting easier and easier and easier. Watching the videos back and editing and listening to your own voice is never, never nice. No one likes that. But but I, getting... think, I think it's listening to your own voice that's the thing. I try not to look at, when I'm editing the stuff, I just then not look at myself. It's just literally, I'm just listening to what's being said. So if, you, if you're worried about how you sound and then as well how you look, and then, then you're going to sort of, you're not going to be creating content again. You'll be spending more more time putting it off than actually sort of creating it. But if you look back on like your like I with your Insta, you can sort of see how you've developed over that. So, so, how, so 67 posts. How long has that been? When was your first post um, on social media? Probably a few months ago, I think. Three months, maybe. Ninth of May. Ninth of May it was. So yeah. So uh, three, three months, over three months. Yeah, three. Nearly coming up to four months ago. Yeah, it's gone quick. I just remember that fear behind putting the first one out like it was yesterday. It's like I was saying before about just taking the leap and doing the, the first one. That's the, I think I found posting the first video more nervy than I did leaving my job. Like genuinely, I, I was so scared behind actually recording a video and putting myself out there. Because you've got all these thoughts in your head of they're going to think this about me or... He's going to say this, or they'll be in the pub watching videos of me laughing about it. And in reality, video out, and no one actually cares. <laughs> no one cares at all. <laughs> it's like you just spent all this time worrying, and it's just wasted, wasted anxiety. Yeah, and that's the thing. And I think that's the biggest thing. Like, if you could, and it's good that you realize that very early on, because there's a lot of people that are still three months in, they still worry about that stuff, 12 months in, and still worry about it. Yeah you've hit the nail on the head nobody cares like nobody's sat there watching if you think about somebody's feed on social media and if your face pops up and it's about mortgages they're just gonna they're gonna see you they're gonna know actually you're a mortgage broker but they're gonna keep scrolling and then they're not gonna be critiquing you and giving and if you do get feedback then great it just helps with the algorithms and it just gets you more views i know when like i've had feedback shall we say in terms of it you just think well great like, that's good i'm glad you can got the time to worry about my reel today on insta when you've got you've got nothing else to worry about in your life but thanks for helping me with algorithms and my reach has increased massively for, for you doing it so but you're right it's just and it was that like something you re was it were you quick to realize that was it something you just sort of thought do you know what i'm just going to do it anyway um it's, it's tricky that because i knew the whole time I knew when I'm leaving my job and I go self-employed, I'm going to have to post videos. Like, cause I knew that was going to be like the main driver long-term of like generating leads and business. So I knew I'm going to have to post videos, but I left, I started self-employed on the 1st of April. And then like you said, it was the 9th of May that I put my first video up. So it still took me five weeks to pluck up the courage to actually get a video out there. So it wasn't easier said than done. But then once you've got the first one up, then it's like you've just jumped the first hurdle, the barriers have come down, you've done it now, it's out there, it's in the in the FNF for people to see. So it's once there's one up there, there might as well be ten up there. And then when there's ten up there, there might as well be a hundred up there. So great analogy. That is that absolutely yeah. Once you've done your first one, then you might as well be have ten, a hundred, a thousand, doesn't yeah. really matter. That's it. And they're only gonna get better the more you do them as well. 
like you said, I go back and I look at the first video I did. <laughs> the camera's like three miles away from me. <laughs> you can't hear a word that I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just thought you, were, I, I just thought you sort of bulked up over a, the period of the last three months, or sort of thing. So, yeah. <laughs> but but that's it's... that you can look back on that. I look back on my like when my first video was, oh, it must be sort of two and a half years ago, coming up for three years ago now. And I remember how much time and effort that took to then just produce that first video and how critique it, and then. I don't know how many in I was like, like you, and you just think, you know what? I just haven't got the time or the patience to worry about this anymore. Just get, just get it out there. Just get it out there. What's yeah. the worst going to happen? This is it. It's all you can do. And if the way I see it is, if I'm looking back at my old videos and thinking they're bad, and that just means they've got better in that time. And I know that in three months' time, I look back at the ones that I'm putting out now, and I'll think, oh God, what were you doing? And then in two years' time, I'll be looking back at them ones and thinking. So it's just this path of growth. And as long as you are looking back and you're thinking, what was I doing? The getting better, which is a good thing. I think if you're looking back and you're not doing that, that's probably a sign that you should be worried because you're not yeah. improving in anything. Yeah, definitely. If you think your first video is your <laughs> best video, then you're doing something wrong. I think that's like the best word of a piece of advice. You, that you, like From your point of view, that is a great piece of advice because, yeah, if you're not, if the first one is the best, then you need to change what you're doing right now. But it's, it's the same thing. It's like the same analogy of what we said before of the best time to post your first video was yesterday. And if you didn't do it yesterday, yeah. you need to do it today. It's just the same analogy. It's just this, exactly the same thing. So when you look at, because your videos, I get comments about your videos. There's people that are prolific on social media that still comment about your videos where like where's your inspiration from is it a certain place or you just like how do you know them down like what like what's your sort of thought process you go through with your videos yes yeah, so the main way that i try and sort of differentiate my videos from everyone else's is with like the editing so i spend a bit more time editing the video to try and make it stand out a bit more there because i'll i try not to take inspiration from other mortgage advisors because then your videos are all just going to look the same because i think that's a, a big problem with that the mortgage industry when i look at other mortgage advisors at the minute a lot of the videos look sort of very samey, samey, same. They're answering the same questions in the same way. And none of them are standing out. And like even a video I put out last week, within a day, two of the mortgage advisors had put out the same video word for word, 24 hours. And, and both those had messaged me in the past about editing videos and stuff. So copying other mortgage advisors never works. What I try and do is I look at other industries. So I like fitness industry, what do fitness influencers do and when they're doing well? Like a cooking one, I saw a cooking video that was good, so I copied like a little bit of the editing from what he does. So there's like, lo if you look at other industries, what works well there, and then try and bring that over into mortgages. Obviously, it's a bit harder because of how sort of regulated we are. It's like the fitness industry, they'll always start by saying like a massively controversial statement, which might be true, might not be true. But you can't really do with mortgages. So there's a bit there of <laughs> There's a bit of difference there, but it's looking at other industries rather than the one that I'm in and then trying to take bits out of each of those and stand out a bit. No, but I think that's a good way. Like, if, if you're seeing... It's like taking your social media feed and when you're scrolling through and you're thinking, actually, that's a good piece of content and I can copy that and remodel it. I'm not going to say copy because that's not right. Remodel it into mortgage broken space. And I think that's just a good way of doing things if you find something that you like the app you like the look of then the chances are if you are your ideal client then your ideal client's going to like the look of that as well so it just makes perfect sense from your own point of view to look at how you can remodel the existing content that's out there that's it it's just about trying to keep it engaging for people as well because if i'm making content for first-time buyers i need to remember that the people who are watching it probably 18 to 30 so they're scrolling all day that if they're listening to me just chiming on about mortgages all the time it's just but I'm, I'm a mortgage advisor and i find mortgages boring at times so someone else watching my videos is listening to me chiming on you've got to find ways where you can make it sort of more engaging you've got to speak in their language as well so one thing i see a lot of is mortgage advisors making videos as if they're speaking to another mortgage advisor so they're throwing in all these words like ltv affordability decision in and it's to the average person the words that you're saying mean absolutely nothing to them so i always think like when i'm scripting my videos i'll always script it with the mindset of would a 12 year old be able to understand this 
And if a 12-year-old can understand it, then it's good enough to go out. But if not, then I'll change the word in and just make it really easy and basic to understand. God. No, no, it makes perfect sense. I, I, you can clearly see that you do far more editing. When you look at the shorts, your shorts and your reels, you can sort of see you spend quite a lot of time of... And it's certainly more time than I do on mine because I'm literally just, it's just the clipping it down. I don't add any of the other... Emojis flying in. And... <laughs> emojis, stickers and all the rest of it flying here, there, everywhere. And then clipping the other... Like I'm looking at the one of your latest ones where all I've got looking back on, me, on your Instagram feed is toddler, I'm thinking 12 months old kind of thing. And you're looking at houses on right move kind of thing. So it's a good... So it's oh. engaging. It's engaging. Yeah, that's it. Because not every video that I post as well is strictly mortgage related. Because I'm trying to cast the net a bit wider than that because people aren't really interested in mortgages. And to get a mortgage customer, you've got to land on the right person at the right time. I think it's quite unique in that it's not like any other product or service really where you can just go and buy it. Like if I'm selling toothbrushes, someone can just buy a toothbrush then and there. But for a mortgage, you've got to land on someone who needs a mortgage at that time, which is obviously harder to do. So the goal is to cast my net, try and make videos that are sort of interesting. So then when they are ready for the mortgage, I'm sort of one of the first people that they think of and they say, oh, Curtis puts these videos on Instagram, I'll message him about it. So some of the videos like that when you're on about there was more of like a, a meme one about looking for houses. And so it's all like property or finance related, but just not strictly mortgage. Do you want a two or a five year fix? Like every video. <laughs> yeah. But that's the thing, like, no, you going back to what you said before, it's, Mortgages are boring. That there's, there's no facts around it. Some people are do get excited by mortgages and, and think, but it's not about that. It's about what the mortgage brings. I've always said that. And the home, the house, the lifestyle, whatever that is, is what the mortgage brings. So you're not focused on the pounds and pence and the two-year or the five-year fix. It's focusing on working with you and I can get you in that three-bedroom semi rather than just looking at a two-bedroom semi. Or look, do you know what I mean? It's just, you, you, it's, clients are sort of looking for what the end product brings not what the product is kind of thing it, that's the thing in it yeah that's it and that's why i think it's so hard especially for remortgages because for a remortgage there is no really end product is there because they're already in the house the only end product is the monthly payment which for us is, at the minute is very difficult because anyone who's remortgaging realistically is going to be paying a higher monthly payment so that's the bit that i found trickiest since starting trying to find a way to sort of attract remortgage customers because there's nothing good about remortgaging at the minute, really. Apart from it being easier to do than the, the, the mortgage in the first place. So yeah. that's, people have just got in their mind that, that the pain they went through when they bought the house or remortgaging. Yeah. But like you're absolutely right. It's not, they're already in the house. That, but then, is it then the monthly payment? Is it then releasing some equity to do certain things or is it then consolidating debt and but you're right it's a, it's a different look to then looking on right move looking at the new shiny house that they want to get into they've already got that's the thing is they've already got it so that new house what it was two years ago five years ago is just a house now it's not it's not what it was when they first bought it two years ago five years ago that's the thing i think people want to buy a house but people need to remortgage and that's like the key difference between the two. Excellent. So what does so we've covered your past, we've covered the present, we've covered like in terms of your social and your Instagram. Any what's the sort of the, the long term plans for for Curtis and Velox mortgages? Yeah, so long term plans, try and keep the, the social medias going, try and build sort of a bit of a personal brand with them, come across as relatable as I can, fingers crossed grow the business that way. That's hopefully the main way that I'll try and grow the business. And then, as you know, I've been making sort of a lot of guides at the minute just to try and give as much free help as I can to first time buyers. So it's just about providing as much value as I can, I think at the minute, trying to play the long term game. If I can give as much, many people as possible, as much free help as possible when it comes to the time that they do need a mortgage, I'm hoping that they'll come to me first before someone else. So just trying to play the long game with it all, give as much value as I can. And then in the future, I try not to look at sort of too short term. When I look at the future, I try and think of like 10 years down the line, 15 years down the line. So I think I'm 25 now, 10 years, I'll be 35. Hopefully at that point, I might have a couple of people working for me, like a case manager doing the admin side of things, like a personal assistant, and then I can focus my time on the bits that I enjoy doing and outsource the bits 
that I don't enjoy doing as much. Which is important, and and you can do that because you you've taken the the brave route now and gone self employed as early as you can. So, yeah, excellent, Curtis. Forty odd minutes in, as always. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, honesty. It's been great to finally, finally get you onto the podcast and talk to. Because I was um, talking to another broker earlier on, and I said, "Oh, I, we were trying to just arrange a catch up." So I can't. Um, I've got a podcast recording late, and they were, they were bothered about who was on the podcast. So I said, "Oh, who was on the podcast?" And I, I said, oh, "It wasn't oh, fantastic." I'm so I'm looking forward to hearing. You see, you might think, "Oh, it's just boring. It's just case. It's just for locks. It's just my story." But people are because people have seen you in their content and they've seen you in their feed. So you got content in their feed. So they are bothered. So it was good to finally get you onto the podcast. There's people that are wanting to listen to podcasts. So I'm going. To, I'm pleased to be able to finally record it and get it out and released but and just thank you so much for your honesty and as i expected anyway and you're quite um yeah and it's just great to hear your, your journey and what you're looking for long term as well so thank you so much mate no worries thank you for having me on hopefully i can come back on in in the future i want to hit some of the goals and talk about that definitely we'll have you back on no doubt about that no doubt about that whatsoever we'll get you back on don't worry Cheers, thanks a lot mate i'll speak to you soon See you later. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Mortgage Broker Broadcast, the podcast which helps mortgage brokers at all stages of their mortgage broking career. If you have any questions about this podcast or any topics you want us to discuss, or if you're interested in working with me further, then please get in touch.